Yo, what's up guys? It's Zigzy. Sorry for taking forever to, you know, post this video. Been uh, a little busy the past few weeks. I was gonna drop it last week, but I found out there was a fifth episode coming out, so I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Might as well just wait. Yo, what's up guys? Editing Ziggs here. So, like a dunce, I forgot to mention the other reason why this video took forever. So, I recorded the reaction as well as me explaining what happens during episodes one through four at the same time. And, again, like a fucking dunce. I didn't see that I wasn't in focus the whole time. So, uh, I basically re-recorded the first part, but, you know, I had to keep the reaction because, you know, it's my initial reaction. I can't fake that shit. So, uh, yeah, just thought you guys should know. Peace! So you guys probably know that a huge ass documentary came out about Nickelodeon and Dan Schneider and basically how there's a bunch of fucking pedophiles making the most infamous kid shows that we know today. And I'm not gonna lie, that shit was pretty hard to watch because it goes over not only the abuse of some of the kids that were on the show, but also the abuse of some of the workers that were on the show too. The first episode is pretty much about some of the cast and crew of all that, talking about their experiences and how kind of creepy and weird and just inappropriate a lot of the shit was that Dan Schneider and some of the writers and producers, they made him do. So there was this one girl in particular who was like Dan's favorite on the show. And you know, he promised her to have her own show, you know, that she was gonna be do big things in the future. And you know, she eventually grew up and went through puberty and they thought, oh, she looks too old, so we're gonna find a new girl. And it basically goes over how she was replaced by Amanda Bynes, but that's not really the shitty part. The shitty part is how close the kids and Dan Schneider were. Basically, if you were Dan Schneider's favorite, they would have meetings and shit like that without the parents in the room. So it would be just be the kid and Dan Schneider. And if you ask me, that shit is sus as fuck because I would not trust my kid around anybody, especially somebody from Hollywood. So the end of the first episode leading into the second episode basically deals with these two female writers that were hired for all that. And they basically talk about the abuse that they endured while they were working on the show. You know, they were basically treated like how every woman is treated in, fucking, in a workplace. The new young macho man, of course, took the positions that, you know, belong to them. So they were stuck in the same place. They also go through how Dan would ask for massages during, during the recordings of some of these kids tv shows whether it's from them or other females on the set someone was always massaging dan and that shit was weird as fuck including amanda bynes including her damn including amanda bynes so basically it all led up to this boiling point so not only were the two women writers on the show forced to share a salary but you know they also got ridiculed they weren't listened to as much and dan basically humiliated one of them one day when one of them tried making a joke and you know dan just took it too far he basically had her act out her being sodomized in front of all the writers in the fucking writers room and that shit is just fucking ridiculous so the second episode basically introduces his mom whose daughter was on one of the shows basically her daughter made friends with one of the adults on the show from how everybody perceived him and from what everybody was said he was a super nice christian guy who had you know his little bible studies you know he was cool with all the kids he usually was with the kids unsupervised by their parents because you know he would give them like tours of the studio and shit like that which that's already a red fucking flag so basically the little girl and this older freak i guess started having like a little friendship that they would email each other back and forth um but you know at first it started off friendly he started asking her oh how are you doing this that and the third and then it eventually all culminated in him sending a picture of himself masturbating to her and mind you this kid is like fucking under 10 years old so that shit is just fucking horrific and i'm not gonna lie the mom you know the mom kind of plays a victim but it is kind of her fault as well because first of all nobody's gonna be emailing or even texting or calling my kid like that there's no fucking way i'm letting a little kid who doesn't know shit talk to an adult like that so after the mother had seen the email she chose not to go to the police because you know she didn't want to ruin her daughter's career in acting but like fuck bro it's worth it, it's worth the risk you're putting a fucking monster in jail I, I mean i'm sure she could find work somewhere else honestly the risk is not worth the reward because you're letting that monster walk around the fucking streets doing that to another kid which did eventually happen and he did eventually get arrested for but he was only in jail for such a small amount of time it's ridiculous and towards the end of the episode they introduce another man called brian peck he was an acting coach he was also framed as this super nice guy helping out all the kids you know cool with everybody the parents love them come to find out that motherfucker was one of the worst people ever so the second episode ends with the biggest cliffhanger because for years nobody had known the child actor that brian peck had abused for all those years and 
we finally find out who it is. It was none other than Drake Bell from Drake and Josh. So the third episode starts with Drake, you know, talking about his life, how he got his start in acting, you know, his relationship with his dad, how, you know, his dad was his manager and how he started working on Nickelodeon. So Brian eventually got linked up with Drake as an acting coach and Drake would go to Brian's house because that's where Brian decided to hold all the acting classes. And if that's not a red flag, I don't know what the fuck is because if my kid is going to do anything with an adult, it's definitely not going to be at their fucking house. I'm going to make damn sure I'm there with them. Throughout the years, Brian Peck was basically, I don't want to say brainwashing, but basically brainwashing Drake into thinking that his dad was out to steal his money. His dad shouldn't be his manager. So Drake eventually made the decision to fire his dad from being his manager and uh, ended up going with his mom because his parents were split. So his mom basically lived like an hour away from where they would film, you know, all the TV shows. So since Drake lived so far, sometimes he would spend the night at Brian's house because Brian would be like oh you know I shouldn't take him at night I don't want to drive so late you know it's getting dark what if something bad happens I'll take him in the morning if that was me I don't give a fuck how far my child is I'm going to go pick him up honestly I wouldn't even let him be alone with them anyways so it happened for a while Drake kept sleeping over at Brian's house so eventually one day Brian Peck sexually assaulted Drake and basically changed his life forever by the way Drake was saying it he definitely said it wasn't a one-time thing so the abuse went on for a while until one day Drake went to his girlfriend's house. So Drake kept getting all these calls on his phone from Brian and he eventually shot off his phone. And then the creepiest part happened. Brian started spam calling the girlfriend's mom's house phone. I don't understand how Drake's mom didn't catch on onto that at all. So like how Drake said in the show, uh, his girlfriend's mom pulled him aside and was like, this shit is weird. Like this does not happen. A grown man doesn't try to reach out to a kid like that. So Drake eventually told her that, you know, he was just being a little weird and he was trying to distance himself from Brian. And uh, honestly, the whole time while Drake is saying this, it's kind of hard to watch because you could see him like reliving it, you know, having to think about all that shit again. And it's just hard to, it's just, it was just pretty hard to watch. So the girlfriend's mom eventually called the cops and they set up like a phone call between Drake and Brian and Brian just said everything that he did. He didn't hold back. What else can I say? They got his bitch ass. But honestly, the most depressing part for me about this whole series was seeing how Drake's dad, who had a hunch the whole time that Brian was like weird as fuck because Brian would touch Drake in weird ways and be super close to Drake. Drake told his dad that Brian had been caught and Drake's dad saying, I'm glad he didn't get to you. Seeing his dad break down after, you know, eventually finding out that it was Drake who was the one getting sexually assaulted was just so sad. So that was pretty much the third episode. Um, the fourth episode starts off with Drake again, and they actually go into the bullshit that Drake has been up to during the years. And I'm kind of glad that they did. I was surprised that they did, but I kind of wish they said, shed a little bit more light on it. I kind of understand why, why they didn't because it wasn't about him. It's more about, you know, Nickelodeon and Dan Schneider and all those people being weird as fuck anyways. So we basically find out that after Brian Peck got out of jail, and mind you, he wasn't in jail for that long. He immediately got hired on the fucking Disney Channel on another show proving that Hollywood really doesn't give a fuck about what you do as long as you're good at your job. That shit just makes me never even want to go to California. So the rest of the episode is basically about Dan. And I'm going to be honest, I wish they had gone more into like, I guess the creepier shit that he did, but they just go into the eventual lead up to him getting fired from Nickelodeon. And the reason is kind of bullshit compared to all the other shit that he did. He got fired because he was being, you know, abusive and he was being an asshole to the cast members and the crew members um, on his shows. And eventually he got fired. So like I was saying, the fourth episode pretty much ends with Dan getting fired and basically being outcasted from Nickelodeon and children's television in general because of the Me Too movement. A lot of people started coming out and started saying a lot of stories about how Dan abused them, all the weird shit that Dan did. Oh, and I didn't even bring up how the Salmon Cat Twitter, which was one of the shows that Dan made, tweeted, oh, hey kids, send in your feet pics to see who has the craziest feet or some shit like that. I don't even know how they allowed to keep that up let alone post that shit. So as I was doing my little research for this, it turns out there's gonna be a new episode dropping next week. And I wanna, honestly, I'm pretty excited to see it because it's called Breaking the Silence. So I don't know if that's gonna be about Dan. I don't know if that's gonna be about another actor or something like that, but I am pretty excited to see it. I really enjoyed the documentary, even though they didn't shed more light on some of the things that, they, that I wish they would have. Like, you know, I thought this whole thing was gonna be about Dan, to be honest, not just about Nickelodeon in general. I'm also pretty curious to see how shit was at Disney because if the shit was like this at Nickelodeon, I can't imagine how it was at Disney. So it's been a few days since the documentary came out and Dan came out with a little interview for himself. So this is going to be the first time I'm seeing it slash reacting to it. So let's see what the fuck this piece of shit has to say. 
Hey, it's Boogie. My boy Tebow, back like he never left. Dan, how are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out. Is there anything you'd like to start off with? Absolutely. Me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. That's how you know this is kind of bullshit because if you were truly sorry, you would have been apologized to those people. You wouldn't have waited till all this bad news and bad press comes out about you to finally, oh, now I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to do that. No, like if you're truly sorry, apologize in the moment or when you come to the fucking realization, not when you're getting called out for it. I apologize to the people who were walking around. His facial hair is kind of pissing me off because, bro, what the fuck is this? Like, if Dan Schneider grew up nowadays, he'd definitely be a Discord mod. I have no doubt about it in my mind. Now, while I do think some of the questions are good, I wish Tebow had a bit more pushback on some of them. Like they pretty much stated earlier, they look like they seem to be friends or at least friendly with each other. It's just a little disappointing to see no pushback, just like letting him speak and get, basically get away with this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit sure. because the series finally painted you in finally. this way that you were just the guy that was doing what he wanted and mm -hmm. people were afraid to confront you about things. What would have been the ultimate way to... Okay, if nobody on the set, if all of the dozens and dozens of adults that were on the set, if they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you got to cut that, I had to do it. I had no choice. Now, I usually give people the benefit of the doubt, right? But in this situation, I feel like this guy was the golden child of Nickelodeon. This guy had so much power. If somebody pushed back, they, they would have been ostracized. They would have been pushed out eventually. While I do agree, yes, you should put some blame on the executives who agree with Dan and approve all these things that he puts in his shows. That still doesn't mean that you should put him in anyways. I feel like he's just using the higher execs as like a scapegoat to say, well, they approved it. What did I do wrong? If, if my bosses were approving it, did I really do anything wrong? Nobody said anything. It's like, yes, bro. The fact that you're so quick to point the finger just shows to me how you're just saying this shit to get people off your back you're just saying this shit so people stop hating on you stop bothering you you don't really mean any of this shit because if you really did if you really did think those things were inappropriate you would say oh i'm sorry that they were inappropriate now just be like well he let me do it he, he he let me do it so i guess it's okay right nickelodeon wanted to do their version of fear factor at the time we were shooting all that so i was tasked with doing these on-air dares with the all that cast so we get with the writers and we come up with all these ideas and it's hard to do because we don't have the budget of Fear Factor sure. and we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So kids. it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff. Now we can't put the kids in danger just like how the adults were on the show because, you know, they're kids. I know damn well if the execs approved that shit, he would for sure do it. And it breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids should. Now, what he said right there is a major red flag. We went out of our way to make sure the kids were safe. Why would you have to go out of your way for that? That should be the top priority when working with children, that they're fucking safe. So the fact that you're saying, oh, well, I went out of my way to do it. What? Now, we also saw the series highlight two former writers viewers, two women. Mm -hmm who spoke about a wage discrepancy. Yeah, but we saw these two women who were writers for you sharing one salary. How does that happen? It's very simple. There's a common practice in television when hiring writers. If you have a spot for a new writer, sometimes you'll go to two writers and say, hey, if you two new writers for your first job are willing to share a salary, you can both have the job. Mm. They have the opportunity to say, yes, that sounds good, or no, no thank you. In this case, it was two women writers. I've done another show where that teaming was done with two male writers and they split a salary. I did another show where it was a male and a female writer and they split a salary. So and these are all first time writers. All first time writers looking for their first gig. Got it. Now in the series- It's so annoying how casually he talks about it because it's like, why should writers have to go through that? Why do you have to go through such leaps and hurdles to become, to get on a writing team or to get, you know, to a certain position, especially, you know, in Hollywood. With how casually he talks about it, it sounds like, that's normal. Like, I don't get why they're complaining about that. No, even if it is normal for Hollywood, that shouldn't be normal in general. They're two people. How can two people live off of the wage of one person? And especially being a first time writer, that wage probably isn't a lot anyways. Before I let you get out of here, I appreciate the vulnerability that you use in knowing that there's definitely things that you would have and should have done differently. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't discussed? Anything that if you could go back and navigate the journey differently, 
what would that look like? He's not gonna say shit. He's not gonna say shit. He's not gonna say. You think this guy's gonna admit to all the creepy shit he's done or any of the creepy shit he's done? To me, all this man has done is point the finger at the guy up top and giving out these shitty apologies to people that, quite frankly, it doesn't seem like he cares about. Because, like I was saying earlier, if he really gave a shit, if he was really sorry, he would have apologized the moment he knew he was wrong instead of now when everybody's on his ass. There's definitely things that I would do differently. Um, one that I think would be really, really important is. When you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process for the specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job, that yeah. they really wanted to be on television. Yeah. Maybe they should even be informed about what that means. What's it gonna mean if you're famous? What's that gonna mean on social media? What's it gonna mean within your family? Let them find out. And then that way, if a kid doesn't want to be on a TV show, they can opt out. Yeah. That, that psychologist, that therapist could come to us and say, this kid is, is, doesn't want to do it, or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's going to come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't want to be there. While on paper, that seems kind of like a good idea. At the end of the day, that shit's not going to work because especially if it's Hollywood hiring the therapist, the therapists are just going to be as fucked up as the people who did all this bullshit anyways. And like, I'm sorry, but there's no way a kid is going to tell the therapist that, oh no, I don't want to be on the show. First of all, it's a kid. Second of all, they're going on a TV show. They're going to be living out their dreams at such a young age. Of course, they're going to want to do it. And based off the track record of Hollywood, if that shit were to go into place, we'd probably be hearing a lot of similar stories as to the ones in that documentary. Dan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Thank you. Oh, brother. You could tell that he was just, listen, that little apology slash, oh, what would I do better? Seems like a kid talking to a teacher after they get in trouble. Like it didn't seem genuine at all. So episode five was pretty much a post-production interview with the people who came out in the first part. The interviewer would ask them how the public's reception has been since the documentary has come out. And luckily it was overwhelmingly positive for all the actors that came out. Episode 5 starts off with a little recap about, you know, all the shit that went down and a little bit of the public reacting to the documentary. It then picks up with Drake Bell and the interviewer. And, you know, she's asking him questions about, oh, how come he finally stepped forward with this? How come after all these years? Which is like, bro, like you come out when you're ready to come out. It takes time to process all that horrible shit that happened to you in the past. So I thought that question was kind of stupid. So like I was saying, it starts off with Drake Bell and basically his thoughts about the audiences reception and if any of the actors slash you know people who worked in Hollywood who were on Brian Peck's side during the court case the people who wrote him all those letters and shit if any of them had reached out to Drake after all these years unfortunately Drake said no none of them reached out to him personally but there have been a few people that have made a few public apologies saying you know once they realized what the court case was about and what Brian Peck actually did they were disgusted by it and another little interesting thing that I don't really know I guess because I don't really have have like Twitter or TikTok or pay much attention to it. Apparently Josh Peck was getting a lot of hate online after the documentary came out because a lot of people were like, oh, how come you weren't in it? How come you didn't have Drake's back all these years? And you know, it's kind of understandable because he didn't know what was happening during those years. And you know, maybe he didn't come out because he didn't have any negative experiences. Like, I don't think you should blame a person just for not appearing on there. Cause I mean, think about it. We didn't even get like the main characters really of any of those shows. Like the only main character we got was Drake and like the all that cast, but it's like multiple main characters in that show. So after Drake saw that Josh was getting all that hate, he just wanted to reconfirm that Josh had reached out to him and they've been talking and now they're cool. And basically he ended up by saying that Josh is a really good friend. So after the interview with Drake, the black cast members from all that reappeared and they were just going over the response that Dan Schneider had about, you know, oh, there wasn't any racism on set. And, you know, I didn't mean for the kids to feel uncomfortable. And they were just basically saying that was bullshit. Shit. They were basically saying that they were used as the token black kid for the shows and they played into a lot of the stereotypes of, I guess, black people in the early 2000s and shit. And how, looking back, that it was definitely pretty uncomfortable because they were forced to stay in that specific role rather than branching out. And they did respond to a lot of what Dan Schneider said, you know, they had his response playing. They said how Basically the same shit I said, how Dan was blaming the producers and executives, but it's just like, you know, the problem starts with you. You're the one making all that shit up and then it gets passed up. And like I was saying, he's the golden boy. They're not going to do anything against him. 
if he's making all that money, all these successful shows. And they basically just confirmed how they did feel singled out for being, you know, a person of color on that set. And they also went over how they felt while they were acting in those skits that had like a lot of adult humor, adult dark humor. And they were saying that, you know, a lot of the time it would go over their heads and the only people that would be laughing were the adults in the room, especially Dan. We got a pretty shocking reveal during this. So apparently Dan had called Gio after he had heard talks about the documentary was being made. And Dan was basically like, oh, I want you to say good things about me because, you know, I never meant any harm, this, that, and the third. And she's like, no, like, what the fuck? I'm not going to talk well about you. You didn't treat us nice. I had a bad experience. Why would I talk well about you? And that's like, that's pretty, it's pretty fucked up to hear. That, that gives less validity to the shit that Dan was saying in his apology interview. Because it's like, if you're asking for her to say good things, about you even before the documentary comes out dude you didn't even apologize you're just like cover my ass before it comes out so after that we get a pretty emotional interview with brian and his mom and they basically go through how being a part of all that and the backlash him and his mom got for his mom speaking out from the producers and from Dan, how that fucked up their relationship. They were talking about how they went to therapy for it and how Brian getting fired from all that was the catalyst of the shitty relationship that they had throughout the years. And because of the documentary, they were able to reconnect and, you know, form that relationship back again. And it was pretty emotional to see. And we also get their reaction to a deleted scene that was a part of the documentary that went over how Raquel, who was on the Amanda show felt disgusted and very angry how there was a skit where Amanda would basically spit on her face for some reason. I forgot like the, the context of the skit. Basically anytime Amanda talked she would spit in Raquel's face and Raquel understandably would get upset and one of the producers basically went up to her and was like listen she's the star of the show just roll with the punches don't get upset control yourself and it's like damn that shit is ridiculous. You're asking a kid to try to control themselves while somebody is spitting in their face which is pretty disrespectful in general so I can only imagine how she felt and I'm not gonna lie Brian's mom had a reaction which yes was very serious and I don't know why it kind of made me chuckle. That's racist period. Maybe it's just me being a little immature, but I could definitely see that being a meme. In all seriousness, it was fucking racist. You're having a white kid spit in a black kid's face as the joke, basically. So after the interview with them, one of the other cast members called Shane, he wasn't in the original documentary, but he steps forward to say how nothing really weird happened to him and how lucky he got that nothing weird did happen to him. But it was fucked up that one day he just appeared on set and, you know, he was fired because they didn't pick up his contract again. But he did talk about a conversation that he had with Brian Peck that was about Brian telling him about blue balls, which is like, bro, the kid's 13. His balls have barely dropped. Like, he's not going to know what the fuck blue balls is. And then after a little talk with him, the other members of the All That cast come in and, you know, it was like a little reunion. And they talk about what they want from this documentary. They just hope that people will wake up and that, you know, this will cause a change in the industry. They're hoping that kids won't ever have to go through this bullshit again. They also implement some ideas like, aside from acting, because it is very hard for child actors to an adult acting career, because, you know, they were dealing with kid shows basically this whole time. They were saying how there should be an initiative to have basically a secondary skill that these young actors can learn so that if, you know, shit doesn't end up working out, they could always have something to fall back on. While I do think it was pretty interesting, to hear and to see them react to the backlash and all of the support that they were getting. I kind of hate post interviews like these because it's so formulated. I wish it was more of like a person to person talk rather than an interview. Because like even though the interviewer was cool, she seems like a cool lady. I don't know. She just seemed like so robotic and she was like on that interviewer mode, like with that interviewer voice. It didn't feel as personal as the documentary did which I guess is like kind of the point a little bit. Anyways, guys, sorry for the long ass wait for this video. New videos coming soon. Like, subscribe, do all that jazz, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.